Welcome to Gaia's Love, a podcast of brief messages to help humanity bridge the gap to the new earth. My name is Vivian Gerard. It is my delight to be a scribe for consciousness today, sharing the wisdom that flows through from source. Here we go. Episode 116. It is Monday today, a beautiful, gorgeous Monday here in Cincinnati. We got all the snow that everyone was talking about, and it is so beautiful. Out of every window, I see brown trees with like that little layer of white snow on them. It's like magic. (laughs) It's so pretty. So I bring you all of that delight in the wonder of this beautiful planet as we start a podcast for a new week, another week. So today we are going to talk about Einstein time. This is a concept that I was introduced to years ago, probably 10 or 15 years ago I read about this, Uh, maybe, maybe 10 years ago. And it's in a book by Gay Hendricks called The Big Leap. It's just one of many beautiful chapters in this book. So the way it came through this morning, I was um, doing my meditation and preparing for the day and thinking about the week, the activities, the to-do list that didn't get done last week, the to-do list that I need to start for this week, the stuff that's due the week after. (laughs) You know, when you begin that assembling in your mind of all the tasks and projects that in your wonder world you would have completed already but aren't complete, I hope you all do this, but I do this. And so I I am famous for having scrap to-do lists all over the house. I recycle envelopes and write on the back of those and then eventually combine them, sometimes put them in my journal. Like, it's a whole thing with me. But as I was mentally doing this, I was just reflecting on, okay, what do I want to talk about today in the podcast? Because that's always the first thing that I do every day, every morning is the podcast because it's the most important thing in my day and um, I learned from Gay Hendricks, you always do the most important thing in your day first, but I'd forgotten it was him who first taught that to me until I was sitting in my meditation this morning and thinking about all the to-do lists and the phrase Einstein time came forward. And I was like, yes, Einstein time, that's what I'm gonna talk about because that's what I most need to practice today and, and really this month, like setting up these routines and becoming more and more efficient as I step into what Gay Hendricks would call your zone of genius. So there are parts I'm going to read um, from his book that are just brief nuggets. Um, What I love is how my soul brought forth the title Einstein Time, knowing it would guide me to the book indirectly to share it with all of you for the podcast, but directly because my soul needed to remind me the concepts in this book are what you most need to be practicing right now. And so Einstein time was the shortcut for me to remember, go look at the book. Because of course I picked the book up before I sat down for this recording and I spent a half an hour reading through parts of the book and looking at all my notes and (laughs) remembering how awesome this book is and what a great resource um, Gay Hendricks has provided for all of us. So, I'll give you my uh, experience of it or the way it feels to me so you can sense uh, the vibration I hold with Einstein time. And then I'll read this a uh, few sections to you. I encourage you, buy the book. If you are wanting to become more efficient this year and to really focus on stepping out of your comfort zone, stretching, becoming bigger in the ways that you do your work and the ways that you support the people around you, He has such practical, spiritually connected uh, guidance for all of us. And I've been applying his principles for many, many years, and they work. And his example shows that. He's a world-famous author, public speaker, came out of retirement because he was bored in retirement. So (laughs) he has much for us to learn from. So here's my experience of Einstein time. Basically what he says is we live in this paradigm of time that 
shows that we don't have enough of it. And so we're constantly rushing against it or running out of it. And when we can flip the switch and realize we have plenty of time and we're the creator of time and we're the ones who are uh, flowing with time, everything in our reality, our physical world, shifts with that mindset. And so we can get more accomplished with less effort in shorter amounts of time. What, how I experience it is through meditation. That's my shortcut, if you want to use those sorts of words. Like, the shortcut for me is to acknowledge my mind, clear what is most pressing in my mind through meditation, through chanting. And then when my mind is just relaxed and not trying to whip me with all the things that need to be remembered, because I've acknowledged it, my soul can start to come through and guide me in what is the most important next step today, this week, this year. And the soul is above the limitations of time. So the soul can see huge, big picture landscapes, big visions, big possibilities. And then what most aligns with that big picture, where the mind wants to keep us safe and keep us in a routine and keep us in what's familiar, the soul is way wiser and bigger than that. So in meditation, after I've acknowledged my mind and let it quiet down a little bit, then the soul starts to speak. And what that looks like in a physical expression for me is I'll have my phone out like I have right now, and I'm flowing, I'm just speaking out loud, and my soul is just speaking through me into the recording on the phone. So I, I create efficiency or um, move time and step into what Gay Hendricks called Einstein time when I have this process of meditation and then recording into my phone. I've bypassed all the delays I would experience if my mind was going, are you sure that's the right word? Are you sure that's the right thing to talk about? Are you sure that's what you want to be doing? The soul just flows and I have perfected the flow of the process. I trust my soul implicitly. And so Einstein time for me is this ability to be really still, to sit really still in my chair with this flow of energy moving through me. And then a podcast is created, a newsletter is recorded in 10, 15 minutes, the copy for my website pages, I just record it in audio and then I transcribe it into my site. At the end of my meditation time or my recording time, I'll often ask, you know, myself, my knowing, what is most important to do today? And so I will create a list. I'll write it down on a piece of paper. First is this. Second is this. Third is this. And then when I'm finished with my meditation time, I move through the list in exactly that order. So from a mind point of view, a lot of what I'm doing in a day may not seem like the most logical next step, you know, like why, how is a podcast serving the growth of my business or the growth of my message? My soul knows why my human mind would try to put numbers and metrics and measurements to it. The feeling in my body when my soul is like, yes, we're going to talk about Einstein time. And I'm sitting here and my whole body's like, I love Einstein time. I love talking about Einstein time. The energy that moves through me, that's a vibration that goes out into the world that my soul wants to go out. My soul wants that vibration sent out into consciousness. The mind doesn't always understand what the soul most wants to do. So for me, that's the best explanation of Einstein time. We don't do things in natural, logical order in ways that make sense to those around us, but we're in such pure alignment with our own flow of energy that so much can get done so quickly. And we're prioritizing what our t task list or to-do list looks like from a different level of consciousness, not from the density of the human experience and what the world around us would tell us is logical, but from what our soul, our body feels excited about. Gay Hendricks calls that the zone of genius. It's when you are in your flow and your flow looks different than anybody else's flow. So it's not a logical thing for others to understand. It's for you to know and feel and trust. And every person's process is different. 
So for me, it's meditation. For some people, it may be yoga. Others, it may be, um, I don't even know, ballet, (laughs) dancing, walking. Um, There's so many ways that you can step into your zone of genius. But as Gay Hendricks describes, you bend time. You get more done than you ever believed you could possibly accomplish. And time sort of just dissolves in that process. One of the um, resources or, um, what the word be? One of the ways that I support staying in that zone of my genius when I'm not in meditation. So I finish my meditation, I open my eyes, and I go start my day with all the activities from this to-do list I've created. Music is what helps me drop right back into that same feeling space when my eyes are open and I'm in front of my computer or in a session or you know moving through my day with my family or my dog or the house or <laughs> whatever else there is. So for me, music is another uh, way of bending time. It's a resource for Einstein time for me. A playlist I have found that I believe holds that energy on Spotify, it's called Deep Focus. My friend Brendan shared it with me. When I put on that playlist and I'm sitting in front of my computer, my mind shuts out the chatter and I'm able to focus my attention so directly and powerfully on what I'm creating or bringing into form. When I take the audio and create a web page or create a newsletter or create something, the deep focus playlist creates this um, container for the energy to move through and it harnesses or activates even more what I'm creating. I believe it's because that playlist has so many people who listen to it and they all use it when they're focusing on something. And so there's this big container of energy that is held in that playlist. And when we listen to it, all of us individually, we tap into everyone being super focused. And so it strengthens our ability to focus. So I encourage you to try that if if that resonates with you. Play that playlist as you're really trying to get something done that you're excited about and see if it speeds up your process or if time sort of bends as you're playing with it. Okay, so I'm going to read uh, some of what Gay Hendrick says because there's some beautiful resources in here. All right, The Big Leap by Gay Hendrick. And it's living in Einstein time. Here's what he says. For your life... To work harmoniously, you need to develop a harmonious relationship with time. Most people have a difficult time balancing all of their priorities, and there is no greater priority than transforming your relationship with time. If you get a handle on how time actually operates, your work flows gracefully and at high performance. If you don't, it doesn't. Before I figured out how time actually works, I put in twice as many hours and got half as much done. Everything changed when I figured out the secret of Einstein time. Now I work half as much and get at least twice as much done. Though I understand the science behind that shift, it still seems like a miracle to me. One immediate payoff of getting the correct understanding of time is that you feel less stressed as you go through your day. That's good, but there is an even bigger reward. You free up time for creative thinking. When you make the shift to Einstein time, you experience a major surge in your productivity, creativity, and enjoyment. The shift takes place the moment you embrace one profoundly simple truth. You're where time comes from. Embrace and embody this truth, and you can experience a quantum jump in productivity and free time. It works so well it may seem like magic, but it's based on solid science inspired by Einstein's physics. Once you understand that you're where time comes from, you have the power to make as much of it as you want. You're the boss. I know that might sound strange, but I promise you that this is the way time actually works. Before I started teaching this concept to others, I learned it myself the hard way. This new way of being with time delivers four main benefits. You get more done in less time, You enjoy plenty of time and abundant energy for your most important creative activities. You discover your unique abilities and how to express them. You feel good inside. 
he talks about the old paradigm, which is New Newton. There's a lot of science stuff in here that you'll have to look at. <laughs> a lot of stuff about Einstein that, you know, maybe you'll get better than I do. I just understand what he's describing in the energy of time. So he talks about the old paradigm. The Newtonian paradigm of time is also its major limitation. The Newtonian view says that there's only a finite amount of time, and it must be carefully portioned out so there will be enough of it to do the things we need to do. The Newtonian paradigm assumes that there is a scarcity of time, which leads to an uncomfortable feeling of time urgency inside of us. It's exactly the same problem we would have if we assumed there was a scarcity of food. We'd always be hungry, and we'd always be afraid there wasn't enough food available. If you've ever thought that way about time, welcome to a very large club. There's hope, however, because while the Newtonian view is where most of us start, it's not how time actually works. Newtonian time scarcity is just a stage we're all passing through, just as Newtonian physics was a stage we passed through on the way to Einstein's breakthrough. The Newtonian, Newtonian paradigm guarantees that you will always have a problem with time. You'll either have too little of it or too much. You'll either have no time at all or be sitting around with time on your hands. You'll be rushing to catch up or bored out of your wits. In the Newtonian world, we're either running out of time or watching the seconds creep by. Think of how many times in your life you've heard someone say, I have exactly the right amount of time to enjoy everything I'm doing. I don't believe I've ever heard anybody say anything like that. Most people seem to live at the two extremes of the time continuum, rushing to stay ahead of the clock because they're busy, or virtually brain dead with boredom because they don't have enough to do. At the heart of the Newtonian time crunch is a dualistic split. We are deluded into thinking that time is out there, an actual physical entity that can put pressure on us in here. That's ridiculous, of course, but try to tell that to a patient in a cardiologist's office. As Meyer Friedman, MD, pointed out in his classic book, Type A Behavior in Your Heart. Typical heart patients have a marked sense of time urgency. They're in a race with time, and their hearts show the wear and tear of it. Newtonian dualism pits us against time. In this paradigm, we think of time as the master and us as its slave. At the extreme, time becomes our persecutor, and we think of ourselves as its victim. Since time feels like an ever-present entity hovering in the background of our lives, we come to feel that we're victims of an entity that's always there all the time. Such a view is dangerous to our health, disastrous for our business, and ruinous to our relationships with family and friends. That's why I urge you to adopt Einstein time. Not only is it a new paradigm, it can literally be a lifesaver. To get to the new expanded version of time offered by Einstein, we also need to make a few changes in how we think about space. When we're running on Einstein time, our experience of time changes because we make a fundamental change in how much space we are willing to occupy. By learning to occupy space in a new way, we actually gain the ability to generate more time. Here's a practical example. Recall Einstein's colloquial explanation of relativity. An hour with your beloved feels like a minute. A minute on a hot stove feels like an hour. This example has everything you need to understand Einstein time and its powerful positive ramifications for how we live our lives. If you are forced to sit on a hot stove, you become preoccupied with trying not to occupy the space you're in. You withdraw your consciousness towards your core, contracting away from the pain of contact with the stove. The act of contracting your awareness away from space makes time congeal. It seems to slow down and harden into a solid mass. The more you cringe from the pain, the slower time gets. When you're embracing your beloved though, your awareness flows in the opposite direction, towards space. When you're with your beloved, every cell in your body yearns to be in union with him or her. Your awareness flows out towards your periphery you want to occupy every possible smidgen of space in the yearned for present. When you're in love, you relax into the space around you and in you, and as your consciousness expands into space, time disappears. If you even remember to glance at a clock, 
you notice that time has leaped forward in great spurts. Entire hours can disappear in the wink of an eye. When your heart is beating in time with your beloveds, your every cell is reaching out for total union. You forget about time. When you're willing to occupy all space, time simply disappears. You're everywhere, all at once. There is no place to get to. And everywhere you are, it's exactly the right time. Now back to the stove. I hope it's been a long time since you've sat on one, so let's use an example that's much more relevant to your daily life. Let's say you notice that your belly muscles are particularly tight on a given morning. You're busy though, so you don't stop to find out why your stomach's so tight. In other words, you choose not to occupy the space of your tense belly by shining the light of awareness on it. You ignore it and hurry on. This is a costly moment though, because by choosing not to become aware of why your belly muscles are so tight, you sentence yourself to a day-long battle with time. Specifically, let's say your belly is tight because you're scared. Let's say you're scared about a visit from your daughter, as recently happened to a friend of mine. He's a single dad whose wife died from cancer several years ago, leaving him with three teenage daughters to raise on his own. Here's the story he told me. About 9 a.m., I was sitting at my desk working on an article I needed to finish that day. The phone rang. It was my 19-year-old daughter, Sarah, calling from a phone booth. She said she was on her way home from her college, a six-hour drive away. She told me she needed to talk to me about something important, too important to talk about on the phone. My belly clenched into a tight fist when I heard that. I begged her to give me a hint, but she simply said she'd see me in the afternoon. She hung up without even saying goodbye. The conversation was so unlike our usual way of communicating that I was dumbfounded. I actually stood there, staring at the phone in my hand for a long moment, before I remembered to hang it up. Then I entered a time tunnel for the next six hours. I must have looked at the clock a thousand times. I would try to concentrate on my article, but my mind would wander back to the conversation. Sarah had always been the responsible one, so my mind was jumping through hoops trying to imagine what was going on. Was she pregnant? Had she caught some dread disease? By 3 p.m., my mind felt like it was on the high-speed setting of a Cuisinart. Finally, Sarah walked in. I said, where have you been? She said she'd stopped for lunch and the restaurant had been jammed. Lunch, I croaked. The idea of eating during the past seven hours had been unthinkable to me. What had brought her home? She told me that halfway through her school year, the full force of grief about her mother's death had descended upon her. She found she didn't want to be there. She wanted to postpone school until the following year, get a temporary job, maybe do some traveling that summer. She was deeply worried that I would feel disappointment and disapproval. She wanted to be able to see my face when she talked to me about the issue. Ten minutes later, we were laughing and crying together, best friends again. He told me that before she walked in the door, time had seemed slow as molasses. The minutes crept by as they will when you look at the clock often. His creative energy disappeared also. No matter how much he tried to busy himself with his work, his mind kept returning to the knot in his belly and the worries in his mind. Suddenly, though, when Sarah shared her dilemma and her desires, time took on a different characteristic. An hour or two flew by as they talked about their feelings about her quitting college. Here's the real Einsteinian magic at work, though. When he sat back down to work on his article, his fingers flew over the keyboard and he finished his project in less than an hour. He thought it would take all day to write it, but instead it took a fraction of that time. So he says, how do we do this? I know I'm going long here. <laughs> Speaking of Einstein time. <laughs> he talks about this. He says, when we switch to Einstein time, we take charge of the amount of time we have. We realize that we're where time comes from. We embrace this liberating insight. Since I'm the producer of time, I can make as much of it as I need. By getting the truth of this statement, we make a major adjustment in ourselves. We heal the dualistic split embedded in the Newtonian relationship with time. We are no longer in an us versus them relationship with time. We're the source of time. And by realizing that fact, we become the truth of it. So he says, claim time is yours and it will release its claim on you. The best way I've found to do this is to become nimble at asking a specific question. The question allows you to seize the controls of your time in your life. There's no trick to the process. You could probably take ownership of time without the question, simply by claiming time as yours to invent as you wish. 
You could do it by saying something to yourself like, I acknowledge I'm the source of time. Look in the mirror and say, I'm where time comes from. He says, the question makes it simple and easy. To generate an abundance of time, ask yourself, where in my life am I not taking full ownership? Another way to ask it is, what am I trying to disown? Or what aspect of my life do I need to take full ownership of? The answer is always blindingly obvious, but we can't see it until we get humble enough to ask the question. Here's the principle behind the question. Stress and conflict are caused by resisting acceptance and ownership. If there is any part of ourselves or our lives that we're not fully willing to accept, we will experience stress and friction in that area. The stress will disappear the moment we accept that part and claim ownership of it. At that moment, the disowned part of us is embraced into the wholeness of ourselves. And from that place of wholeness, miracles are born. How to begin? He says, begin with time itself. Do whatever it takes to get yourself in harmony with the reality that you're the source of time. Once you're convinced, start acting as if it's true. A simple way to begin is to put yourself on a radical diet. Complete abstinence from complaining about time. This courageous move will take you out of the victim position in regard to time. When you stop complaining about time, you cease perpetuating the destructive myth that time is the persecutor and you are its victim. Okay, here's what he says to notice how many times you say things like this. I wish I had time to stop and chat, but I'm in a hurry. Where did the time go? There simply aren't enough hours in the day. If only I'd gotten another hour of sleep. Love to talk, but I've got to run. I have to get to the bank. I don't have time to do that right now. Each of those statements contains an overt or covert complaint portraying the speaker as a victim of time. It treats time as a scarce commodity, sending the message that time is out there and there isn't enough of it in here. The moment you stop complaining about time, you free up the necessary energy to mount a similar, complain on the in, a similar campaign on the inner plane. It is quite another thing to stop feeling that you're the victim of time. So, here's his invitation at the end, he says, of this chapter. He says, at this point, it would be traditional for me to say something like, take plenty of time to master these principles. However, since you're the source of time, we will amend that to make plenty of time to master these principles. The original insight that we are the source of time, that time is not a pressure from outside, that we can make as much as we need, takes only a split second to comprehend. However, it takes a lot of practice to integrate that insight into the practicalities of our lives. The main thing it takes is keen attention. Be on the lookout constantly for complaints about time that come out of your mouth or go through your mind. As you spot them and eliminate them one by one, you will grow steadily less busy while getting a great deal more done. Okay, <laughs> one of the longest podcasts I've made in a while with the topic of time as its focus. So we are bending time. It's going to take some focus to make those shifts and to pay attention to the words and the energy that you hold about time. But perhaps this is a challenge we can all give ourselves. Let's see what shifts. Let's see how much more we get done, how much we, we enjoy what we're getting done as we stop complaining about time and become the source of it. So this podcast was as much for me as for all of you who are going to listen to it. <laughs> uh, good stuff for a Monday morning. Thank you for tuning in to today's vibration. 
Let's take this message of pure love out into all of our communities and continue expanding love here on Gaia. So much love from my heart to yours.